So uh, warmest greetings, everyone, for the second day of a map to the door of no return at 20, a gathering. My name is David Cheriandi, and I'm a writer uh, based in Vancouver upon the traditional unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil peoples. I would like to begin this first panel for the day by reading a land acknowledgement for the city of Toronto, my birthplace and the place where the conference was organized. We begin with marking the violent histories of where we are, with making note of and reminding us of the ongoing conflicts and contradictions of this land, this water, this air. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petin First Nations, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee. The meeting place of Toronto remains the home to Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. These Americas are built on violence and erasure. And we bring these histories with us, those native to this land, Indigenous peoples from other territories, as well as white settlers by conquest, and those of us who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonization, imperialism, and ongoing wars. When we enter any room, even or especially virtual rooms like these, we must bring these histories into view. This acknowledgement is particular to Toronto, the location of York University, and the host of A Map to the Door of No Return at 20, a gathering. But we are meeting together virtually from countries around the world with their own histories of conquest, white settler colonization, slavery, imperialism, and ongoing wars, then we must acknowledge and bring those histories and presence into view. It is with this knowledge we enter and meet here in hopes of making a different world. So it's been for me a marvelous uh, first day in celebrating the work of one of our greatest living writers. And I'm so thrilled and honored to be moderating this panel with the acclaimed writers and thinkers, exemplary writers and thinkers, Tiana Reed, Sam Tackle, Kagora Macharia, and Z Zakaya Iman Jackson. I'd like to get right to it then with the papers offering a bio for each speaker just before they offer their words. But uh, first I have a few uh, quick announcements. First, uh, five new reflections will be made available on the website today by Amber Johnson, Amber Rose Johnson, Leanne Simpson, Kevin Adonis Brown, Andrea Metabarsky, and Natalie uh, Bat uh, Batraville. Um, it's also the case that a new reading um, of Brand's work by Michael Buckner will also go uh, live today. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, I'm truly looking forward to hearing um, this paper and all of the others. Um, again, it's such a, such a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I'll begin with the bio. Uh, Kagoro Macharia, a, you, he is a independent scholar from Nairobi, Kenya, who works on the seam between Africa and the Black diaspora. Macharia is the author of Frottage, Fictions of Intimacy Across the Black Diaspora, and as we all know, many other extraordinarily um, important works. <clears throat> The title of Kagora Macharia's paper is Traveling with Dion Brand's Map. Uh, Kagora, please uh, join us now, if you will. Thank you, David. Traveling with Dion Brand's Map. I begin with two epigraphs. Our imaginations connect us. There is a place where we know one another. And perhaps that place is the page 
Yamira Figueroa Vasquez. Why is all geography irony, Dion Brand? I failed geography in primary school and it was always the same section that tripped me up, the map section. The map on exams was fairly uncomplicated. It was a map of the place colonizers named Kenya in 1920. We were supposed to identify 15 to 20 key features, mountains, rivers, lakes. I could identify the big stuff, the Swahili seas at the coast, Lake Victoria, which cleaves Kenya and Uganda, the water making nonsense of borders, Lake Turkana, a finger pointing down from Kenya's Northwest, demanding accountability for the multiple crimes committed there by the Kenyan state. Mount Elgon straddles Kenya and Uganda and Mount Kilimanjaro straddles Kenya and Tanzania, sutures that refuse borders. As I describe this, I realize I had no problem naming the places where borders dissolved, where the waters and the mountains made relation, not division. Borders are fictions, except when you travel. Borders are fictions, except when you travel with an African passport. Borders are fictions, except when you travel with a black face in a black body with black hair. Black hair? Black hair is when you arrive at security and they insist on running their hands through your hair and you have to decide if you will keep your hair as is or if you will live with the humiliation of security guard after security guard running their hands through your hair, through your blackened hair. The black security guard at the South African airport asks about my black hair and I do not have the courage to keep growing it. I cut it. Passports dissolve at borders. Simone Brown teaches me this. Dion Brand writes, I am delayed in Frankfurt for four hours. When you are traveling, time is sometimes a pain. You wish to arrive. You are impatient, especially when traveling to Africa. Europe is a nuisance. It is in the way, yet it is the only way there from here. I have been reading The Blue Clerk on and off for a year, a verso a day on the days when I can. For which verso I write something, sometimes echo, sometimes response sometimes an accumulation of details that are cut through with quotations from the daily verso. And this practice has made me think about Dion Brand's forms and how they call and where they call from and what they call for and who they call to and what it means to listen and what it means to hear and what it means to respond and how to discern the call that wants a listening and the call that wants a response. Sometimes the black diaspora calls and Africa responds. Sometimes Africa calls and the black diaspora responds. Most times we exist in the tangled frequencies of calls and responses as we pursue freedom. Here is one tangled frequency. I passed through the Frankfurt airport once on my way to Kenya. The wait was long, though I forget how long. I had arrived from Washington DC and was on my way to Nairobi for six months. At the Frankfurt airport, you are directed to the terminal for flights to Africa. It is a long distance from where you arrive. I forget now if we took a shuttle to get there from the main terminal it feels as though we did. The terminal for planes to Africa is in an isolated corner, far from where other people fly to Europe and North America and Dubai. In that isolated terminal, far from anywhere else, 
we wait for our different flights to Africa. It feels like a hold. We are blackened. In that terminal that, unlike other terminals, has the barest of facilities, no duty-free shopping, no restaurants or cafes to sit in, nowhere to get fresh tea or coffee. Perhaps there were a few vending machines. A hold? Yes. As I was rereading that paragraph to revise it, I noticed that the tense had changed from past to present, and it changed with the sentence, it feels as though we did. I opted not to revise it. I want to think about those many moments when a particular door or room or encounter cuts through time, moving us from past to present and from a present that will pass into an ongoingness that we experience as the afterlife of slavery, which is both truncated and extended time. This now feels like that now, in that other now, in that other now, in that other now. Now compounds. And in this compounding now, we stretch to catch the next breath and the one after that, and the one after that. The door multiplies to the hold where we are blackened. Zakia Iman Jackson gives us language to describe how we are blackened. Plasticity. We are sub and supra and human simultaneously. The door multiplies. In Traveling While Black, Nanjala Nyabola writes, during the three weeks I was in Nepal in 2019, my guide constantly refused to refill my water. It began almost on the first day. He had asked everyone to buy a Nalgene water bottle, but I didn't want to buy one because I preferred to carry a water pack on my back. Water is withheld, given reluctantly, borrowed from a fellow traveler. She writes, from around the third day of the trip, in order to get my water pack refilled, I had to ask a white Australian man in my group to ask the guide on my behalf. Otherwise, I would not have had water. Yes, borrowed, not given, but it's not enough. Nanjala gets dehydrated. Her body begins to shut down. She writes, it was not lost on me that I was the only black woman in my group. It wasn't lost on the rest of the group that he spoke to me in a way that he did not speak to other people. Nanjela doesn't write if her fellow travelers intervened on her behalf in some way. I suspect they did the equivalent of sending private DMs instead of standing with her in public. It gets worse, far worse, but far worse doesn't always feel like it. There wasn't a moment when everything started to collapse. It wasn't that something specifically happened. My body just started getting tired. I felt like I'd been fighting for air for so long and I just wanted to stop fighting. Fighting for air, so long. Nanjala is airlifted to safety. Airlifted to safety from a vacation that she had planned and saved and trained for. Airlifted to safety from a cruelty that almost became deadly. The door of no return stitches the time of colonial modernity, marking the limits of emancipation. I learned this from reading Rinaldo Walcott. Yet, and we must have a yet in this gathering, because this gathering is a yet and more than a yet. A map to the door of no return ends with a map, not a door. Let me cite the final sentence. A map then is only a life of conversations after a forgotten list of irretrievable selves. This ending is an opening, making me trace the mini maps that lead to and around and from and within this gathering. In its most local instance, 
It is a map that tracks across this panel with David and Tiana and Zakia and Sam and myself, all of us bringing our tangled frequencies. It is a map made of YouTube videos featuring the songs and sounds and whispers of multiple voices gathered by Dion Brand's map into a chorus. Memory, history, direction, waywardness, response, repose. It is a map of quotations posted across social media of a rainbow of colors used to underline and highlight and squiggle and annotate the map that gathers us here. Listen, maps. An oral route here is a long poem containing navigational instructions which sailors learned by heart and recited from memory. The poem contained the routes and tides, the stars and maybe the taste and flavor of the waters, the coolness, the saltiness, all of finding one's way at sea, perhaps too, the reflection and texture of the seabed, also the sight of birds, the direction of their flights. Dion Brand's map leads me back to the geographies I failed, to their textures and vibrations, to their cleavages and sutures. Dion Brand's map leads me here to the geographies and histories of our gathering, to our geohistories with our songs and poems, our tender bodies and generous imaginations. Dion Brand's map leads me here to a now that feels more possible, to a now that feels less lonely, to a now where other travelers map routes with which to think and live, to a now where other travelers make paths where others might tread. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Kagoro, uh, for a truly uh, profound paper. Uh, we'll be reflecting upon that for a long time after, I suspect. Um, so I'd like now to um, welcome our next panelist. Uh, Sam Teckel is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at X University. Uh, X University, of course, is in Toronto. It was named something else before. His work focuses on Black and diaspora studies, urban studies, and the sociology of education. His forthcoming work, Black Grammars on Difference and Belonging, focuses on the experiences and perspectives relating to Blackness and Black identification of East African diasporas across the UK, Canada, and the US. Sam has held graduate student fellowships at both Harvard and Northwestern University in their respective African and African-American studies departments. A former middle school teacher, Sam is a community advocate who has worked on a number of community projects concerned with the well-being, social lives, schooling experiences, and educational outcomes of Black students. And of course, if you live in Toronto and if you live everywhere, you know how, how true uh, these, these statements are and how important Sam's work has been. The title of Sam's paper today is Black Grammars on Difference in Belonging. Uh, please join us, Sam, if you will. Thank you so much, David. And for the, the team of people it takes to organize uh, such a, a momentous and wondrous event. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Uh, there is so much to say about Dion Brand's map to the door of no return and how it has impacted my thinking. I could speak to how it has attuned me to specific words to remain on guard for, the violence they both enact and obscure, like belonging, or the possibilities in space that come to be opened up by words like rupture and void, and the spaces that open up and stay with you, inside you, as sites of reinvention and creativity, that to admit to the void, to our vantage point to it, is not submission or simply endless lack loss or deferral. In this presentation though, what I want to do is detail the, way, the ways MAP provided for me a whole infrastructure 
of analysis, a method, a guide, and when necessary, a bomb. A whole other social that centered black life, black sociality, and how it not only validated my current writing project titled Black Grammars, but marked so clearly for me its necessity and modeled its constitution. You see, one mark of touchstone works and the generational shifts in perception they leave in their wake is in what these works make possible. Simply put, a project like Black Grammars is only possible because MAP found me. And I had those that stayed with me and helped me to read, reread, and understand the deep lessons it has taught me, those lessons I was stubborn to, and those that they continue to teach me. To put it bluntly, MAP found me and rescued me from the rigidity of the normative social sciences. Black Grammars, a project on difference and belonging, is an intervention into a set of fields, African diaspora studies, Black studies, and works to interrupt the way sociologists have always examined, marked, and accounted, rather than attended to, Blackness and difference. These fields, and so these sociologists in particular, articulate Black life as, a, as existing solely across two polarities. On the one hand, as wholly subsumed with questions of race and racism and its resistance, and on the other hand, an accounting of ethnic particularity as an explanation and stand-in for Black difference as wholly absolute. On both of these ends of these polarities, the door of no return remains invisible. So do its lessons, its hauntings, its voids, and its ruptures. We simply appear in these studies or in these works as raced or racialized or blackened. These studies and their methods thinned out the black life I knew when I moved in the world. The black life and the black spaces Matt told me was even in places as always and already worldly, was love enough. The capacious blackness that I knew I needed to attend to, it both seemed to me and felt to me and that's it's something that I knew long before I knew how to articulate it, the kind of sociology I wanted to do. Or as Ronaldo uh, Walcott put it on day one, of this most deserving gathering, the ethnography of the black interior that Dion Brand lays out in MAP was just more interesting. Let's put it, uh, put it one way, a sociology of the door of no return is from where black grammars emerges in the wake of the rupture and the void. I just knew there was more uh, to the blackness that I was reading to black life right there at the fingertips of my experiences and in MAP. MAP and the door of no return made possible for me to see so clearly what was being missed the thickness and unruliness of Black sociality, its capaciousness that is laid out in all its fullness and its com complexities in MAP. If McKittrick reads Dion Brand as a geographer uh, and Ronaldo Walcott as an ethnographer of the Black interior, then for me, Brand is also a sociologist of the Black diaspora, one of its best. MAP is one of its quintessential texts. I have this idea I'm trying to work on called Black Third Spaces to signal and otherwise from the ways Black social life has so often been written and understood as simply oscillating between uh, ethnic particularity and the realities of racial terror. Ethnic particularity becomes absolute and our positions as targets of racism is overdetermined and together they form this thin Black sociality of what we are, un so are meant to understand is, is Blackness and sociality. Map details and otherwise for me. For us, MAPT helped me see so clearly that what was on offer, this all encompassing condition of racism or this sometimes insular, inwardly facing navel gaze and diasporic condition was not enough. Like Brand does in MAP, I make use of these everyday scenes to demonstrate that there is so much more, so much being missed about how black people just be on their own terms in and amongst each other. A lot more was left to be attended to. That more, that otherwise I call black third spaces as a heuristic for that space in between, excuse me, in between to give analytical credence and problematize the ways black sociality appears. In fact, blackness itself is difficult for normative disciplines and frameworks of thought. Map and Dion Brand helped me get here. I think of black third spaces as not only a more generative site of contestation and negotiation of how we grapple with the haunting, the door of no return makes of us and for us, but also, also as a site of making and one of creativity and invention. It, help, it helps me think through the sites of black sociality where blackness is played, expressed, and its differences contested and worked on. Not worked out, but worked on, and helps me better articulate black grammars. And as Kagiro Machiara has taught us, the fraudish from which they generate. 
Other than the entirety of MAP itself, some examples of Black third spaces is in the exchanges the narrator and MAP has with other Black people at the parking lot, at the coffee shop, the courthouse, and everywhere in between. I'll say more in a bit about how Dion Brand writes the Black Nod, which lives in the larger project of this work. But the importance of MAP for me and Black third, uh, Black third spaces as a social, spatial, hermeneutic is in how it marks the Black sociality that is produced when Black people from different places and with different histories are living, playing, working, and thinking collectively in urban spaces and who have come from different sides of the door, different sides of the void. Like Brand, I'm interested in shining light on the kinds of spaces where Black people are making their lives, where a certain kind of work is done that both animates and makes sense of Blackness and difference and surprise and diaspora and loss. We cannot forget loss. The idea of Black third spaces comes from my desire and the permission map provided for me to think an arena of Black cultural discourse, circulation, and exchange that subverted a kind of American exceptionalism, that unproductive heliocentric Blackness, but that also did not negate the door of no return and the afterlife of slavery. I wanted to think of a space for thinking Blackness that was not based in continental post-Middle Passage uh, subject chauvinism, mired in being either after and therefore exempt from the history and archive of the transatlantic slave trade and middle passage or above and sometimes as it appears in these works uh, beyond it. I wanted to think and envision an arena of and for blackness so thinking across direct descendants of and post middle passage subjects an analytical space uh, for what uh, Ashton Crowley calls our sacred interrelations. Also detailed in part I think uh, by Muhammad Abdul Karim Ali on day one of this gathering and also in his text, Angry Career Somali Boy, a complicated memoir, which for me is an example of what uh, Kevin Kwashi also called on day one and was urging us toward the kind of memoir that has a kind of fidelity to randomness, to a kind of affect or heightened sensibility, to incidents and anecdotes rather than a straight line or complete line from beginning to end. I think Angry Career Somali Boy, complicated memoir is an example of that as well. Rather than working outside of these histories and realities or erecting the door of no return, the rupture, and the void as an irreconcilable divide, MAP demonstrates for us that we instead mire and mix within it. And then not for the purpose of crafting plans of escape or loopholes of retreat from the difficulty of violent histories in those afterlives we all live, but rather to think through what substantively working on them without the intention of working them out might look like. Engaging, uh, as Muhammad Abdul Karim Ali put it on day one, the silences. Bran writes, why consider the door of no return? because it exists without prompting. It exists despite all efforts to obscure it or change it or reinterpret it by its carpenters or its passengers. The door of no return is ocular, it is propitious. From it, one may reflect, grasp. These analytical and material spaces, black third spaces and the moments of difference and surprise they open up for us comes to be expressed materially, imaginatively and through a range of temporalities. Our expression of these, the structure of relations and feelings we generate, their fraudage, so, so to put it, are making sense of these, uh, I'm calling uh, Black grammars. I think Black grammars attends to the questions of how we might think Black difference otherwise, how we account for and attend to the multiplicities of Blackness made ever more complex by various trajectories that make up the fullness of the Black diaspora. An analytic that attends to these gaps, the silences, the inconsistency, and also centers the way Black people relate to each other in everyday context across the door of no return, rooted in Black diasporic society. Like Brandon Mapp, I'm interested in Black relationality anchored in the ways Black people play, politic, and perform difference amidst and amongst themselves. And whether we say it, deny it, the door of no return is always present. At the same time, I think Black grammars interrupts the stability and durability of difference narrowly expressed through geography, nation, episteme, and reductionist notions of identity on which normative scholarship on Black people so overtly relies. Black grammars brings to the fore the ways Blackness is dialectical, syncretic, and reciprocal. Again, MAP uh, got me here. This project started with a desire to center my experience and those of us, and those of a set of Black people from the Horn of Africa who have made lives elsewhere from where they began, and the Black people from past generations we encounter in the places where we landed. And as Matt tells us, that is what we do in diaspora. We land on docks and on ports in history. Matt told me this was okay. Gave me permission to start with us, begin with us and stay with us. Matt taught me, taught us this was enough, that we had and are enough, love, complexity and fullness. 
one of the many less one of the main lessons of map for me is the reality that for many black people in the diaspora ancestry genealogy kinship and rights of return are merely fanciful privileges of the imagination entirely flights of fantasy the movement of black people in this century is still difficult troublesome and cumbersome and still ongoing we have been forced to make sense of our lives in tongues that are not our own but we have and we are and sometimes new grammars can emerge that tie that can tie and bind in new and creative ways because as so many have already remarked the door of no return is that too creativity reinvention so then so this project then made possible by map and so many others it's that it has inspired is also about how we black people in diaspora encounter each other and make a new black grammar is an imaginative humanity it's about how we live with and alongside each other it's about our source of self-regard as Toni Morrison might put it the sociality we make it's also about how our freedom dreams get expressed how we mobilize our liberating drives in concert no matter where they may have first germinated it's about how they sound on the street the barbershop on campus and everywhere in between I'm writing the Black Nod as a communicative technology of Black grammars. Brand writes the Black Nod differently. For Brand, the Black Nod is a Black Nod, Vancouver. And I quote, Vancouver, 2000. Waiting for the bus at Granville and Robson, the bus arrives, a Black man is driving it. The city has few Black people, so few that when they meet on the street, they nod to each other in surprise. Perhaps delight, certainly some odd recognition. Surprise, delight, some odd recognition. Brand continues, I'm sitting on the bus driving along Granville with a friend. She and I observed this transaction. We just made a similar one ourselves with the bus driver of Lost Paths. The bus is full, but there are really only four of us on it. The driver through Lost Paths stops and lets someone on and someone off, people who don't realize that the bus is empty, but for the four of us. The four of us pause at these intrusions, but we go on. We have perfected something, each of us something different. One drives through lost paths, one asks the way redundant, redundantly, one floats and looks, one looks and floats, all marvel at their ability to learn and forget the way of lost maps. We all feign ignorance at the rupture in mind and body, in place, in time. We all feel it. Brand writes the Black Knot differently. In the larger project, I link uh, thinking Brand's Black Knot alongside Tina Camp's Black Gaze. Uh, that remains a work in progress. But to conclude, Map gave me the language and space to continue to think Black grammars as an analytic of Black difference. It urged me to sidestep the propensity to provincialize Blackness on racial, historic, ethnic, or national registers, or even on which side of the door we may have landed based on the circumstance of birth. We are all in its wake. We all feel it. Map helps us to push past romantic and redemptive registers of return, of rescue, repair, and redress. But in doing so, gives us back to ourselves fuller and with possibility, and with what I think is a greater, not so thin love. Because as Toni Morrison reminds us, love is, or it ain't, thin love ain't love at all. Uh, and neither is, as Brand puts it, thin camaraderie in the diaspora. Because the best love stories, the best Black diasporic stories, if we still have an account of what those might be, are those that offer us back to ourselves, that, allows, that allow us to meet ourselves constantly and anew even if we are, as Bran writes it, sometimes adrift. And as Map has taught me, if we have space and grammars, we might just find our way and meet. We always meet after the pandemic. Don't you remember? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, sincerest of thanks, Sam, for sharing with us your uh, crucial work on Black grammars. I'm looking forward very much to uh, hearing and reading even more. So um, I just want to uh, mention to the the uh, all of us uh, gathered here um, that uh, you can use the Q and A function to ask questions uh, starting now, and these questions will be uh, organized by the uh, session uh, administrators, and then I'll be able to pose them immediately after the papers. So. Feel free to start um, uh, asking questions now, again, through the Q&A function. So uh, now it truly is an honor to uh, be introducing Tiana Reed. Uh, Tiana Reed is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of English at Brown University. Her writings have been published in American Quarterly, Art in America, Book Forum, Freeze, the New York Review of Books, and the Paris Review, among other places. 
She is a former editor at the New Inquiry and PINCO and currently sits on the editorial collective of Women and Performance, a journal of feminist theory. She will join York University in July 2022 as an, as, as an assistant professor in the Department of English. Big scoop uh, for York University, for sure. Um, the title of um, Tiana's um, paper is, uh, in fact, there are two titles and perhaps Tiana will, will elaborate. Uh, the first is, One is Not in Control of Dreams on Noting and Noticing, and another titled, um, as Tiana explains, could have been Only of Drift on Note Taking. Uh, so Tiana, uh, if you'll join us, please. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And thank you to all the organizers of this conference. And thank you, of course, to Dion Brand. It's really special to be here for a number of reasons. And I hope some of them come through in the talk. This talk is called One is Not Control in Dreams on Note Taking, Noting, and Noticing. Another title could have been, quote, only of drift, end quote. I hate committing to titles, which is probably why I was so drawn to all of Brand's subtitles peppered throughout the book. Rereading A Map to the Door of No Return, Notes to Belonging, this time around, I was especially drawn to Dion Brand's practice and method of noticing, noting, and note-taking. Many at the conference so far have explored Brand's particular cartography, her practice or science of map making and wayfinding. One way that she does this, um, one way among many, of course, is through noting, noticing, and taking notes. Organized by numbers and headings, some poetic, some descriptive, some a mark of a place and time, many of them repetitive. Wondering about the shape of the book, its formal organization, which is also an informal disorganization, I have compiled all of the notes with headings into a list. In other words, I tried to gain control, which is a fiction that Brand cautions us, cautions us against. So here are all of the headings in the book. Maps, a Derek Walcott quote, pray for a life without plot, a day without narrative. Maps and more maps, beats one through four, conjugations in disgrace and paradise, October one and two. And of course, there are also fragments or notes that are just marked by spaces or by lines and don't have headings. The subtitle of Brand's A Map to the Door of No Return is, quote, notes to belonging, end quote. This is the reader's first clue to her writing practice, her arrangement of notes that she also refers to as fragments. If we read Brand's subtitle suggested by the colon as an instance of description, we are reading notes to belonging. If what comes after the colon notes to belonging suggests an expansion or an explanation of what comes before it, a map to the door of no return, we might assume the notes are part of this map. Brand also pushes us to see how diaspora repeats this vacated materiality, maps, notes, doors, maps for places with no maps, doors for rooms with no door, notes for writings with no conclusion, black being with no possibility of return. The preposition two in the subtitle I think is particularly well placed. The subtitle reads notes to belonging, not notes on belonging or notes from belonging or notes about or against belonging. The two prompts me to ask, 
are the notes written teolo teleologically toward belonging, approaching belonging, in anticipation of an arrival of belonging? Or are they written in something of an epistolary fashion as a letter to belonging, an address to affiliations and identifications as a writing from that distance, suggesting ever more that distance? Because of course we see early on in the book that belonging is placed directly next to unbelonging, that belonging is something of a trap, that belonging is reluctant, that belonging gets us nowhere except, except perhaps here, that belonging is insecure, that belonging can be forced upon, the, upon us, that belonging slash unbelonging to something might be necessary for fighting against something. Given too that there is no table, table of contents in Brand's map, no collected place to see what all of these notes are or how they are laid out, it is through reading, through being in the thick of it that we feel the unraveling of the text, these waterfalls of notes. Reading, of course, we see how these notes bring sometimes disparate things together, allowing for associations to linger in a way that refuses single issue politics. The subtitle serves as it always does an announcement of form and content, but also as an address, a direction or a movement, ske sketching the shape of Brand's collection of fragments signaled by subtitles and numbers. We see notes that are, as Brand writes, quote, disparate and sometimes only related by sound or intuition, vision or aesthetic, end quote. F following the subtitle, notes have their own relationship to belonging belonging as drift. As Rand writes in the middle of the book on page 118, quote, I stepped into the cool opening of the door of no return. My feet landed where my thoughts were. This is the trick of the door, to step through and be where you want to be. Our ancestors were bewildered because they had a sense of origins some country, some village, some family where they belonged and from which they were run. We, on the other hand, have no immediate sense of belonging, only of drift, only of drift. The overall arrangement of a map to the door of no return reflects belonging's expression as a certain drift, as the accident of one's birth, as a kind of arbitrariness. This skeleton of notes or fragments or fissures is the framework is a framework for intervening in the constantly shifting and exclusionary and violent notions of home, nation, and the world. Brand deploys notational fragments to organize the disruptive elements of diaspora, which comes from the etymology meaning scattered across, some of them uninhabitable. Brand posits knowledge or knowledge's possibility, quote, only by self-observation, only by looking, only by feeling, end quote. And in so doing, she disorganizes the sensorium of a stable self through small insights, quotidian observations, and the personal meditation as a threshold of a vexed belonging and unbelonging. Allow me to read this quote, which comes from the first part of my first title, um, one is not in control. One is not in control in dreams. We need a cognitive schema. This door is really the door of dreams. This existence in the diaspora is like that, dreams from which one never awakes. Then what can be called, then what here can be called cognition, let alone a schema? A set of dreams, a strand of stories, which never come into being, which never coalesce. One is not in control in dreams. Dreams take place. The dreamer is captive, even though it is the dreamer who is dreaming, captured in one's own body, in one's own thoughts. To be out of possession of one's mind, our cognitive schema is captivity. But what of all rebellions, emancipations, political struggles for human rights? Aren't these part of the schema too? Yes, except for the perpetual retreats and recoveries in the diaspora, as in bad dreams, you are constantly overwhelmed by the persistence of the specter of capti captivity, the door of dreams. 
Dramatizing this cognitive schema, Brands notes sometimes, but not always, center the personal or rather the autobiographical example, offering and withholding cognitive control. The speaker tells the story as an I, but often slips into a we. That difference between I and we marking a difficult relation. Diaspora is one arena where this arrangement, this difference, attachment, disidentification is played out. Insofar as diaspora can be said to resist waking life, naming instead a site of dreams or a set of dreams in Brand's words, where despite all of its movement, its potential for juxtaposition, juxtaposition and play, we, whoever we are, lack control. One is not in control in dreams. This non-sovereign dreaming engenders a practice of letting go, letting go of the romance of the nation state, letting go of the fantasy that institutions provide for action. In classic psychoanalysis, dreams have a function of representation, content, desire, conflict, investments, confexes. But what about the impossibility of leaving the dream state, despite it being a door, the door of dreams, a door presumably being able to open and shut? Brand writes that, quote, to live at the door of no return is to live self-consciously, to be always aware of your presence as a presence outside of yourself, end quote. For me, Brand's notational framework is part of a practice that offers some relief or some surrender to not be in control, a way to move around, to observe, to be aware, to continue to read and to write under the chokehold of the nation. Notes are not quite a way to bring control, order, and organization, but at least to shape a map to those necessarily inaccessible quote, strand of stories which never come into being, which never coalesce, end quote. The notes bring a certain attunement, both a politics and a pedagogy that emerge from the mode of being without control. The notes make way for an undoing, an interruption of the very usness that diaspora both assumes and makes impossible. After reading and rereading Brand's notes to belonging, I might also add that to live in the Black diaspora is to live as a note among notes, as a collection of notes, an inventory of pain and wounds that keep reopening and scabbing over. Or as William Anderson put it in his reflection, which is on YouTube, I had to understand that the idea of completion I was trying to work myself into was not a story I wanted to be a part of, end quote. Alas, in conclusion, but not in completion, I would like to say that it is not often that I get the chance outside of teaching or maybe the very narrow and market-driven confines of a book review to really meditate on one single book. I feel grateful as well that it is this book for all its academic and literary significance in Black studies, Caribbean studies, Canada studies, diaspora studies. It also describes my upbringing in deep detail. I see not quite myself reflected back, but I see the self disrupted through the yoking of Canadian citizenship, the lure of multiculturalism, the logics of racialization and gendering, the mark of slavery. The book literally describes where I grew up, down to the streets, quote, the north side of St. Clair between Bathurst and Vaughan, end quote. For my whole childhood, I lived close to those three streets on Viewed, on Winnet, on Arlington, on Cherrywood, on Witchwood. I say these names with some sense of belonging, perhaps to a place that no longer exists, now surrendered like so many other places to condos with names I am too embarrassed to say. This place does not love me back. Reading Dion Brand's map to the door of no return again and again, I can see how belonging is just like this, full of shame and anger and uncertainty and dis disaffection and distance and disappointment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tiana, for that uh, most moving uh, conclusion and, and also for enabling me to newly note uh, through your close and original analyses, uh, the granular br brilliance of Brand's text. Um, 
So finally, it is truly a very special honor to be able to welcome Zakia Iman Jackson to this panel. Zakia Iman Jackson is an associate professor of English at the University of Southern California. Professor Jackson is the author of Becoming Human, Matter and Meaning in an Anti-Black World. Of course, uh, as doubtlessly we know, um, extremely important text. Her research explores the literary and figurative and aspects of Western philosophical and scientific discourse and investigates the engagement of African diasporic literature and visual culture with the historical concerns, knowledge claims, and rhetoric of Western science and philosophy. Becoming Human, Matter, and Meaning in an Anti-Black World was recently published by New York University Press in May 2020 as part of the Sexual Culture series. Becoming Human argues that key African-American, African, and Caribbean uh, literature and literary uh, and visual texts generate conceptions of being and materiality that creatively disrupt a human animal distinction that persistently reproduces the racial logics and orders of Western thought. These texts move beyond a critique of bestializ uh, bestialization to generate new possibilities for rethinking ontology, our being, fleshly materiality, and the nature of what exists and what we can claim to know about existence. Jackson argues that the texts and artistic practices featured in Becoming Human generate alternative possibilities for reimagining human beings because human is in, in uh, parentheses, human being, because they neither rely upon animal objection to define the human nor reestablish human recognition, quote marks, within liberal humanism as an antidote to racialization. Ultimately, becoming human reveals the pernicious particularity of reigning foundational conceptions of the human rooted in Renaissance and Enlightenment humanism and expresses in current multicultural and expressed in current multiculturalist alternatives. What emerges from this questioning is a generative, unruly sense of being, knowing, feeling existence. Professor Jackson is at work on a second book tentatively titled Obscure Light, Blackness and the Derangement of Sex uh, hyphen Gender. It argues that anti-blackness constitutes the bedrock of modern Western logics of sex hyphen gender and meditates on how its territorizing vertical orders might be toppled by the transfiguring potentialities of blackness. Ultimately, the project provides a critique of biocentrism or biological reductionism and determinism and elucidates the indistinction of sex, gender, and race. Jackson has published in Feminist Studies, Kipal, Critical Humanities and Social Science, Catalyst, Feminism, Theory, Technoscience, South Atlantic Quarterly, Eflux, and Twice in Gay and Lesbian Quarterly. Again, it is a tremendous honor to be welcoming uh, Zakia to uh, the panel. Zakia, uh, if you're uh, willing, please join us. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so uh, there's so many things that I learned from MAP. Um, one of those things is it's taught me the vastness and the depth of the questions of myth and origin. And this paper is an attempt to think with gratitude um, with that unsettling. Um, could I have slide number one, please? Joy Bolawimi and Timnit Gabru's analysis of computer vision is instructive for gleaning how the politics of sex differences and gender informs the anti-Blackness of visual technology and culture. They demonstrate that while Shirley cards are rarely used in the era of digital photography, darker skin continues to confound in ways that reveal that recent photographic
sorry if uh, there are tech people there. I think um, Zakia might have, uh, we might have lost the volume on Zakia. Uh, actually, David, I believe that she lost connection with her earpiece that she was using. Unfortunately, there isn't much that uh, I can do about that from here. Okay, I'll just take it out. Can people hear me? That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I was in the first sentence, so I'm going to start over, but I'll go quickly. That's great. Joy Bolem, Winnie, Joy Bolem Winnie and Timnit Gebru's analysis of computer vision is instructive for gleaning how the politics of sex differences and gender inform the anti-Blackness of visual technology and culture. They demonstrate that while Shirley cards are rarely used in the era of digital photography, darker skin continues to confound in ways that reveal that recent photographic technology is also not value free and that computer vision is biased against darker hued females and trans people in particular. Employed in high stakes sectors such as law enforcement and healthcare, automated facial image analysis is used for tasks including facial detection, classification and recognition that are built into most social media platforms, internet search engines and smartphones. Bolem Winnie and Gebru found that these mechanisms perform with the lowest accuracy on darker females and completely fail to register the diversity of trans realities of sex and gender, extending the racial and gender logics of comparative anatomy and eugenics, its reading of the surface, hue, and facial geometries proves shallow as the look of sex and gender are already racially prescribed and proscribed. Thus, such facial recognition software trained with biased data misgenders darker skinned females and trans people via what is so often assumed to be socially neutral, the algorithm. I want to pause here to tarry with the difficulty of conceptualizing accuracy in this context. If accuracy is defined by the conflation of surface effect with truth, then in fact, there is a gross error. And that this notion of accuracy rests on what a surface comes to mean via its metaphysical mystification, not its endogenous essence. From this perspective, one could very well argue that Bolemwini and Gebru's findings do excavate a latent truth. The social inscription of sex gender is fundamentally a racially misogynist logic that constructs Black femaleness as apparatic and indeterminacy that does not yield resolution in the face of purported visual evidence of sex. Imperceptibility sets limits on all perceptual frames. Thus, one cannot collapse image matter with either materiality or being. The spectacle of realness swallows transness up. It substantiates via transphobia's racially misogynistic underpinnings. As Eva Hayward succinctly states, observing the implications of trans feminine artist Erica Rutherford's paintings, quote, photography is a naive technology for representing transsexuality, end quote because the referentiality of transsexuality cannot be imagistically realized. Photographic logics, or what she calls the photoontic, suggests that photography captures the real and presupposes the photo self as sex. But this is a logic that can never capture or represent innermost knowledge and bodily sense. The materiality of embodiment, the body as feeling, sensation, and process of concatenation exceeds photographic representationalism, and the sensual body eludes photographic capture. Eliza Steinbach's groundbreaking shimmering images, trans cinema, embodiment, and the aesthetics of change in speaking to the pressures of a gender sex system that seeks to make public the so-called truth of a trans person's sex and gendered body via a transphobic common sense, follows Mika Ball when Steinbach argues that visuality itself should be put in the position of being the primary object 
of study, such that visual studies should not presume, quote, it already knows what is visual and what is not, forgetting the profoundly impure act of looking, rife with interpretive framing, complexly mixed media, soliciting synesthetic sense perceptions, and bursting with affect, end quote. At the core of my work has been the claim that anti-Blackness's affects and epistemological conditions have fundamentally organized the optical common sense and modern grammar of sex gender. The clinical demand that the proper performance of transsexuality be defined by, quote, compulsory adherence to white gender norms, end quote, I'm quoting Steinbach here, must be understood as translations of the fungibility of the slave as commodity to evoke Hartman, the thingliness that Spiller's terms the flesh, and what I term ontologized plasticization, a racially sexuating semi-material entangling inherent to racial science, racial reproductive science, that affect a problem space that has become synonymous with notions of the void, black hole and abyss in black feminist theory, black feminist queer theory. After all, quote, compulsory white gender norms, end quote, are not simply one set of norms among a parallel array of racially demarcated gender norms, but have and continue to be a racially ontologizing effect of relational hierarchies that accompany the ongoing past of conquest, enslavement, and imperial expansionism. As Horton Spillers instructs, anti-Black gendering and ungendering in all its paradoxes is an essential determinant of how gender whiteness norms, and certainly white gender norms, have come to be represented, known, felt, perceived, disciplined, and regulated. In other words, the exterioceptive ego and proprioceptive ego of whiteness are no less formed by the theater of race than that of black folk. Like Steinbach's shimmering images, my work seeks to challenge the scientism of observation that expunges the power of the unmarked, unspoken and unseen. Rather than presume that to see is to know or that the seen self corresponds with the sentient self, I am interested in the historical, perceptual, and epistemological conditions that make a reflected self appear transparent and foster attempts to master opacity and fluctuations in the visual field, which Steinbach terms shimmer. Shimmering, they maintain, suspends epistemological disbelief. If represented as occupying a space marked by sex gender. Darkness and blackness are often sex as female, are perceived as symbolic of the maternal by a wide range of artists. For example, Wangechi Mutu describes black in the following way, quote, black is the first and very last color of consciousness. Any nascent memory or experience we might have of floating around in our mother's insides, organs hardly existent, eyes, ears, sensory organs minimally developed. It's black and deep purple and murky dark, dark blues that are a backdrop to origination and our first recognition of existence. Blackness surrounds our planet and our universe more than any other color, In quote. In a very different context, a round table on the topic of Blackness in 1967 that included artists Aldo Tambellini and Michael Snow, musician Cecil Taylor, architect Harvey Cohen, sociologist Arnold Rockman, and influential modernist Ad Reinhardt. Reinhardt readily evoked conflations of Blackness with the maternal perhaps belying his claim that his own monochromatic Black paintings were a respite from the demands of narrative and figuration, as well as what he terms symbol. Quote, I suppose it began with the Bible in which Black is usually evil and sinful and feminine. There is a relation in Christianity to the Black hellboy and white heaven myth, 
the blackness of darkness that is involved with formlessness or the unformed or the maternal, the hidden guilt, origin, redemption, faith, truth, time, end quote. The troping of blackness occurs in terms that inform the racial logics of sexual differences, whereby blackness is occupied by an imagined space bound up with formlessness, the tethering together of black maternal corporeality rather than embodiment and formlessness shapes the perception of the black female sex as simultaneously indeterminate and divergent in relation to categorical forms such as sex and gender. While negating and even nullifying assignations of blackness abound, what requires sustained investigation is the gendered and sexuating force of compounding anti-black assignations, the way that femaleness, maternity, and feminine gender expressions marked by blackness have been made to bear the burden of blackness's nullification and are instrumentalized in the anxious arrangement of representation and value, including but extending far beyond the terms of sexual differences. The idea of origin is commonly conflated with the maternal body, in particular, the black and maternal body, in a way that problematically figures the origin of existence, of life, of racial blackness, even though, in fact, sexual reproduction is neither the origin of life nor the origin of the species we call human. Such narratives and figurations obscure three billion years of living organism activity involving microbial life and non-sexual reproduction in the Archaean and Protozoic eras. As Myra Hurd notes, quote, during most of our evolutionary heritage, our ancestors reproduce without sex. And most of the reproduction that we undertake in our lifetimes has nothing to do with sex. In quote, organisms in four out of five kingdoms reproduce without the requirement of sex. And some species of fungi have sexes that number in the tens of thousands, not to mention the many species that change sex or are intersex. The presuppositions of dimorphic sex polarity and the primacy primacy of sexual reproduction has left most of the current reproductive activity of the human species obscured and under research, which affects a double privileging of organisms as autonomous individuals and of sexual reproduction. To put it plainly, what I'm suggesting is that what seems like the most, what seems like the most natural starting point, the scene and means of birth, is neither natural nor the starting point. Nature or rather biology itself unsettles the mythopoetics of Genesis, its heteronormativity, its essentialized notions of sex difference and its sanctification of the individual and by extension troubles what Sylvia Winter calls, quote, the substitute religion, end quote, of neo-Darwinism and its theodicy, survival of the fittest. What if we replace the ideals of a stable, knowable origin with the flow of infinite regression and the primacy of the individual with profusive differentiation? What might that dislodge in our racialized imaginations of both sexual differences and the mythopoetics of maternity? And what might it open up? At the same time, how might an acknowledgement of more lived ontic embodiments and mutability escape the capture of the codes and operations of racial hierarchies that equally and readily adapt to sex gender binarism and pluralism, given that anti-Blackness subtends both configurations. It is by working through these two challenges together that it may become possible to discern Blackness's latent transfiguring potentialities and how we might make sex gender indeterminacy work in the interests of the nullified. Might such a praxis expose ontologies of sex gender to a sublime derangement? When discussing Faith Ringgold's, um, could I have slide two, please? 
when discussing Faith Ringgold's fascination with how an artist represents themselves. Feminist critic Michelle Wallace, Ringgold's daughter, ponders Ringgold's exploration of the classic genre of the artist's self-portrait. Curiously, in, exam in an example she discusses, the artist and his model, Ringgold is seemingly absent, per Wallace. Quote, the artist portrayed is a black male and his model is a white female. Moreover, the actual artist who has composed the composition is not male at all, but a black female. It is interesting to think of this painting as an uncanny self-portrait in disguise. End quote. Ringgold's painting might be commenting on the assumption that an artist is male or masculine, potentially black in the circle she traveled in, but not a black female. Its suggestion that the Western model of aesthetic beauty is typically imagined as a white female is hardly surprising. We're call here photography, Shirley Carr. Wallace wonders, but where is Faith's ring? Where is Faith's perspective? Neither white nor masculine in this picture, even as a teenager, that question fascinated me, end quote. If we consider the prevalence of conflations of blackness with femaleness, maternity, femininity, and the yet to be gender differentiator, perhaps Faith's perspective is not absence, but rather perceptible in the ground of the painting. The blackness through and against which the two figures appear a dense darkness marked by recession, not lack or absence, where blackness abuts and provides contour and dimension to their respective forms. The painting does not simply frustrate representationalist expectations that the artist be mimetically represented, but rather refracts such conventions by revealing the anti-Black sex and gender terms of the given idea or ideals of both the artist and the appropriate subject of ex exaltation. At the same time, it exposes that the operations of representationalist visibility are predicated on the limiting terms of anti-Blackness, which is to say the racialization of sexuation itself. The artist and his model invites a pondering of what is below the radar of scopophilic objectification, its pleasures and its identifications, that which is illegible to the positive values of gender and sexuation, while nevertheless providing those values their negative space. How are the limitations of the given order of sexual difference and economies of desire built into and dictated by the materiality of the visual arts, not just by its representations? And how might we transvalue what is deemed mere excess, despite the anxiety aroused in the face of it? The interrelations of embodied life history and semiotics cannot be transparently read on a face or a body. Biography and character are not visualizable but they nevertheless compose our embodiment and existence. Ringgold's use of figuration against the mandate of, of representational verisimilitude approaches the uncanny. Um, last slide. She severs the all too easy equation of figuration and representationalism, an equation often, ho often hoisted onto the minoritized. Transparency in the mode of self-figuration and self-narrative is commonly deemed the only appropriate subject for such an artist. Figuration in the mode of her Black Light series and the artist and his model is not representation, but rather a style of critique of the suffocating terms of figure ground, subject object, sexual difference, and representationalist transparency. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zakia, uh, for uh, an extraordinary um, essential uh, work. Um, I, I uh, don't believe I mentioned the title uh, or the, uh, the project, the broader project that uh, this is based upon, and that is um, work on the materiality of Blackness. So um, 
Uh, thank you all. Um, again, just a, a, a second thanks to Zakia for, for uh, ending the first part of the panel um, on such a powerful, important note. Um, there is uh, now a time for questions. Um, and, um, and what I'd like to maybe uh, announce at this time too, um, just make one quick announcement uh, if the uh, questions are coming in. Um, uh, I'd like to draw your attention, of course, to the next panel at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this is the creative panel, Fields of Imagining, with Natalie Diaz, Turquasi Dyson, Kai Kello, Kanisia Lubrin, Brandon Shimoda, and this will be moderated by Nanjala Neobola. Um, extraordinary uh, panel of, of artists of different sorts. Um, so I, I urge you all to, to attend that. I'd also just like to give a quick uh, shout out to the, um, to the people who have organized uh, this panel, um, organized the entire conference, uh, Christina, Andrea, uh, especially uh, for uh, weeks, months of tireless work, and also the organizing committee, uh, Kinesia, Ronaldo, Leslie, Ellen, uh, Aisha and uh, Marcel Ann. So um, I don't know if I'm, I hope I'm looking at the right place. I'm looking for um, questions in the chat. I don't see anyone, but I do have, I guess I do have something I could, um, a question I could pose to all of you. Oh, it's not chat, Q and A. Okay, that was my mistake. Wonderful, okay. Um, so um, maybe I'll just I'll I'll um, I'll go straight to one of the questions. Um, so this is from um, Sophia. I hope it's okay that I, I mention who these questions are from. Question is Kagora. Thank you, along with um, uh, Mohammed Abdul Karim Ali. Yesterday, you uh, have reminded me of what it was like to look at Africa's colonial borders as a child. Oh, and by the way, I wonder if we could all come on screen right now, all of the uh, panelists. Uh, the disconnect between the straight lines and the features of the land creates alienation, a wounding that must have ongoing effects, including ecological ones. How might we approach this, which artists and thinkers might help us? And uh, this is for uh, Kugura. Um, thanks, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Thanks for being here. Um, well, I mean, Dion Brand is, is, is my first answer. Um, but, but then if I could just take your question um, in a slightly different way, I think Zakia's paper just now um, did something really similar, right? Which is to, to undo and what to unthink the borders of sex, gender in a way that was just fantastic. I look forward to her work. Um, and, and, you know, your own work, Sophia, I think does that in terms of genre. Um, and, I, you know, I, I defer to others on this because I, you know, my, my, my knowledge of people is terrible. Um, uh, Yvonne War and Wageshi Mutu would sort of be the others that, I, that I'd put there, and Christina Sharp. That being, those would be my, my, my quick list. Thank you so much. Um, please join us, everyone, um, on the screen. Um, all, the, all the panelists, it'd be great to, to see you if you're, if you're able. Um, so um, I have a, another question uh, that um, I'd like to ask here. Sorry. Hmm. For some reason, I'm having a bit of a challenge getting into into the Q and A. Um, it, maybe in the in the uh, meanwhile, I have a question to all of the, the the panelists, or who really who anyone anyone who wants to to respond to this. Um, it's impossible to 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 <laughs> to mention in one breath uh, four extraordinary uh, papers. Um, uh, but I did notice a, a recurring uh, question, um, and it kind of spoke to uh, one, um, one comment at the beginning of the uh, remarks I, I began with. I didn't compose them, but I thought they were just so thoughtfully composed. The, the hope of making a different world and the question of seeing, um, hearing, feeling uh, that difference. 
I remember Kaguro's uh, phrase that he used, powerful phrase, this gathering is an and yet, uh, an and yet in the midst of our painful and, ex and essential uh, uh, observations, I, I, I believe. Sam likewise drew our attention to the black third space and how it signifies and, and, uh, and otherwise. Tiana drew our attention to non-sovereign dreaming. And Zakia drew our attention to uh, how the work on the materiality of blackness challenges the scientism of observation, particularly around sex, gender. Um, I'm just wondering how MAP particularly um, does the work of drawing your attention to these these alternatives, these differences, uh, these possibilities uh, in the midst of, of, of the painfulness of, of what we know. Anyone willing to, to take the question? I can just say just a couple of quick things. This is a question for everyone, right? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Okay, I can just say a couple of, of quick things. You. Um, you know, when I read MAP, you know, having read and taught repeatedly um, Horton Spillers, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, that question of myth and um, Spiller's engagement with Roland Bart in that text always kind of like was kind of um, something faint going on in the background of my thinking. And I think reading MAP, it really brought, it really foregrounded this question of myth and especially reading, whether it was reading Hegel, which reads like a mythology of Africa or reading um, natural philosophies depictions of the African, um, there's a way that I was like realizing that I was working with a mythology. And um, what Matt did was teach me to how vast and deep that question of myth um, and origin is and to linger in that place. And so, so much of um, the book lingers in these questions of origin and myth. And I, and I still have not been able to let go of those questions as I move into the next project. And I will continue to return to MAPS thinking on these questions um, because I, I think really as a field, we have just barely kind of scratched the surface of um, the, how incredibly, um, how incredibly constitutive, formative the questions of origin and myth really are um, for the questions of Blackness. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I can follow that. I can try just quickly. Mm -hmm. Rand also writes that myths are powerful and it takes material force uh, to, to propagate them, to promote them, yeah? And there's this scene, and it, it's just such a great scene uh, where I think the narrator's observing, uh, like, a, I, think, I think it's a, a man uh, trying to romance a woman and speaking of like Afrocentric, you know, uh, myths. And, and the woman submits for the sake of the coming romance. I think how I end, I, I don't know how many of these mythical romances we can continue to afford. Uh, and if, if we are to both remake ourselves and the world. And I think brand, um, that's what brand's map does for me in thinking about what's at stake, not only in how we might see each other and see ourselves, uh, but for the sake of the world, <laughs> the one that we need to change, yeah? So I think I think just to add that to Zakia's response. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, if, I, if I could add one more note, which is um, I'm, I'm thinking with Tiana's um, noting, noticing and taking notes um, and the beautiful and really difficult end of Tiana's paper and thinking about that, what felt like a turn to me, which is also a turn about myth and origins, which is how does one sit in them as you're doing these things? Because they're also working on you and acting on you. 
I, mean, I don't know if Tiana would like to say something about just that, because um, that was just a, a powerful and thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, the question about, the question I think that you started with David, like about alternatives, um, alternatives can be hard, I think, because sometimes they reproduce the very structure that we're attempting to critique or change. Um, but I do think that Kiguro, this idea of dwelling um, and the turn that I made, I mean, I always think about the opening, the opening of the book, which is, I guess it's page one, um, the door, but to the door of no return, which is illuminated in the consciousness of blacks in the diaspora, there are no maps, right? And so what does it mean to dwell in that no mapped place? Um, and is that an alternative or Ronaldo Walcott used the, the language of invention um, as well? Um, and yeah, I think what's really powerful is the like lingering and sitting with this um, this no mapped place or this place of no return. Thank you all for those um, those essential thoughts. Um, I have uh, perhaps time for one uh, other question. This is from Ryan. As uh, Tiana beautifully emphasized by repeating belonging, I wonder how the panelists think about the history of this word. As Sam said, the violence is it enacts and obscures, this is belonging, the senses of the of be the property of and be a member of first recorded in the late 14th century, just as the theft of Africa was beginning. Further back, it traces to the old English uh, Langian too long to yearn for, from the older German uh, Langona to grow long, desire, yearn for, some etymology uh, going on here. I wonder about this sense of longing, yearning that is in belonging prior to it becoming an issue of property, something Ronaldo Walcott has addressed so powerfully. And there is simply the sense of length, uh, not width or height in belonging. Does Tiana and maybe other panelists see this longing and length in Brand's use of belonging and unbelonging? Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for that question. Uh, would anyone like to respond in closing? Well, I'll just say that like, in terms of the longing of belonging, I mean, I think that for me is where the those sort of negative affects come to mind, right? Shame, disappointment, um, because there is a sense of there is a sense of longing. But I think you know, I mean, I loved William Anderson's thing, his his reflection. But I think training ourselves not to seek that longing is part of the practice of, of reading the book um, again and again. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, if I could just add, I think um, what Sam said about how we gather um, and how we are, we, we are brought together, I think that's what takes the place of longing Right, and, and that's what invention for me actually is, is the spaces where regulation is made, um, which makes longing and, and sort of not necessary in some ways, right? It's kind of there, it's still a faint hum, I think. I don't think the hum ever goes away, but I think um, I was so drawn by Sam's imagining of collectivity and collective making as something that, that can you know, do more than origins ever could. Thank you so much, uh, Kuguro. Um, well, it it is the it is time right now. Um, I'll be I'll be thinking of uh, these presentations, uh, your words, for uh, quite some time after um, my mind and heart is uh, is very full right now. So, um, and I want to thank everyone for attending um, uh, attending this gathering, and uh, draw your attention again to the upcoming panel at uh, two o'clock. Um, 
So uh, warm wishes to everyone. Uh, take care.